Order, and it's time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Um, we'll uh, start with uh, listed questions, as usual. Can I inform members that question 8 has been withdrawn? And I call Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. Question 1. Uh, with your permission, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, I'll answer questions 1 and 4 together. Uh, I am pleased that our consultation document for the racial equality strategy is now available on the OFM DFM website. The consultation will last until the 10th of October 2014, and details of uh, consultation events will be listed soon. Uh, as our strategy document together, Building a United Community states, it quote, is not intended to replace or subsume our work on racial equality and good race relations. Rather, it will complement and provide the coordinated framework for aspects of its delivery." Unquote. We consider it very important to retain a specific focus on racial equality and good relations. Uh, therefore, we propose to retain the existing racial equality panel to implement the strategy. Where appropriate, the work of the panel will feed into together building a United Communities Community Tension subgroup and the ministerial panel or into delivering social change structures. Uh, our review of the good relations indicators highlight, highlighted four indicators that were specifically relevant to outcomes for minority ethnic people. It was clear that they would not capture the breadth of information needed for the new racial equality strategy. As a result, a separate set of racial equality indicators has been developed within the good relations advisory group. These will be consulted on alongside the strategy itself. Well, Ms. McGahan for supplementary. I, I thank the Minister for his response. Minister, would you agree that the issue of racial intimidation needs to be addressed, needs to be acknowledged and addressed urgently? Uh, well, of course, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, all instances uh, of uh, racial tension need to be uh, addressed, and particularly where it involves intimidation or hate crime. Uh, worse still, where it involves uh, attacks on members of uh, the, those who could be profiled uh, because of their, their race. It's a, a matter that has caused considerable concern to the PSNI. They have reported uh, an increased number of racial incidences and racial crimes uh, over the, the last year. Uh, I trust that uh, the work arising out of the, the strategy because the strategy without action points attached to it and funding for those action points uh, will not help. But it, it is necessary that we start taking action arising out of this strategy. I call Declan Michael Lear. Um, I understand that the strategy was signed off at the beginning of June. Could the Minister indicate what was the reason for this delay? Well, my understanding uh, is that uh, there were, I think, about uh, eight changes required in it from uh, the DFM side. Uh, none were required by us at all. Uh, we were quite content with the changes required by DFM, but one of those changes was that there would be included in the strategy uh, a forward from the Deputy First Minister and myself, which became available to us on Friday and was signed off immediately. It was. And I call Mr. George Robinson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker. What steps can the First Minister take to, to alleviate issues around race relations while the de development of the racial equality strategy, strategy continues? Well, uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, a strategy is an important part uh, of that. And my understanding is that uh, while I've heard a number of people talking about waiting for, for years, it actually only came in at the beginning of June uh, into OFM, DFM. But the, the real requirement is to change people's mindset uh, to ensure that we have a welcoming environment in Northern Ireland for people from all racial backgrounds. Uh, that is something that uh, becomes more difficult at times when people feel that they aren't getting services or they aren't getting jobs uh, and others uh, are. The truth of it, of course, is for those of us who go around and speak to employers, many of them couldn't operate their businesses without those from uh, ethnic minorities coming in. Uh, they provide colour to uh, our community uh, as a whole. Uh, they should be welcomed by everybody uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I, I hope that the racial equality strategy will help 
to get that message out there and that we can have the action points attached to it which will encourage people to, to get involved with their neighbours no matter what background they come from. Sir Alban McGuinness. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, would the First Minister accept that it is the duty incumbent on all who hold high office, including his own office and other ministers, uh, to condemn forthrightly and unambiguously, without ifs or buts, any form of racism? And I refer in particular to the incident in East Belfast where a house was allocated to a Nigerian and the First Minister in that situation tended to defend or explain away uh, the reasons for that obstruction by local residents. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I did no such thing. Uh, indeed, if uh, one was to listen to the interview in full, one would see that 90% of it was condemning uh, any type of uh, racial uh, activity or intimidation. If the member, maybe because I, I do have two minutes rather than 15 seconds to, to answer, let me break the issue down. First of all, the, the idea of uh, local houses for local people, uh, that from a social housing point of view is something that people can argue. Uh, I don't believe it can ever be the only determining factor as to why somebody should get a, a house. It has been in the past and could be something for which points could be allocated. But if you have a difficulty with uh, housing allocations or with the allocation scheme, the answer is to go and see the housing executive, to see your local elected representatives, whether in the council, whether in the assembly, or whether at Westminster, and deal with those matters through them. The answer is not to stand outside someone's uh, house allocated to them, because no matter what their background might be, that, in my view, will be seen as intimidation. Uh, and certainly, if somebody from a, a different racial profile is involved, it will certainly be seen by them uh, as being racially uh, motivated. Uh, the, uh, the local people themselves said it was never their intention uh, to do it. Indeed, some of them indicated that they never knew who the house had been allocated to. But whether it was allocated to someone from a different racial profile or not, uh, it still was intimidation. I think any of us would know how we would feel if we turned up to a house that had been allocated to us and there were protesters outside saying local houses for local people. Uh, so those are the issues that are in involved. Uh, I condemn any form of uh, racial uh, attack. I inform any, uh, oppose any form of uh, racial uh, intimidation. Uh, and I believe that it's uh, essential that our communities are open and welcoming uh, to all of those, no matter what uh, religious, political or ethnic background they may, may have. I call Mr. Danny Kinahan. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his uh, answer so far and particularly welcome that the racial equality strategy is now out and there to be consulted on. But would the, minister, would the First Minister put on some dates or timings as to when he expects legislation to come through on the back of it? Um, and will that include refugees and asylum seekers? Well, it seems uh, that uh, although we were criticised for taking our time and bringing it out, in actual fact, the Deputy First Minister and I have moved faster, I think, than the civil service because while it's on the website in terms of the document, we have not yet got uh, the uh, pages up that allow people to answer the questions that are contained uh, within the, the, the document. Uh, the consultation process lasts until uh, October. It takes us over the summer holidays, and that's why the, the longer period uh, is being uh, allowed. As soon as we have that, evaluate the responses. Uh, I trust not just uh, legislation, but I, I trust that we'll be able to move forward to, to real action points. That's not to say that we are not taking action at the present time on a number of issues, because again, we are spending uh, over a, a million pounds uh, every year uh, with one particular fund, but going ahead with other projects as well. So uh, there is funding available for projects, but fitting it into the strategy, I uh, hope we will see that happening after the October period. I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Principal Deputy Speaker, <clears throat> the McPherson report, which is referenced in the racial equality strategy, says that a racist incident means any incident with a race dimension and covers both crimes and non-crimes. Would the minister now accept that he was wrong 
when he was interviewed to say that the racist intimidation against Michael Abioni was not racist. Well, it seems even when I go into detail, the, the member doesn't understand the difference between a racial incident and a racial crime. Uh, a racial incident is a racial incident because any individual feels that they have been uh, attacked because of their racial background. That makes it a racial uh, incident, no matter what the intention was of the individuals concerned. It becomes a racial crime, uh, of course, if there was an intention on the, the part of the, the individual uh, and they, they did uh, carry out uh, an attack or intimidate it. Thank you. And I call Mr. Fran McCann. Gormilama Ugat, a pre last concorla. A case of a da, question two. Mr. Speaker, with your pro Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with uh, maybe a few months too early, uh, I will ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer the question. Thank you. That. In January of this year, we took a decision to develop a new gender equality strategy based on the review that was carried out in 2013. Since then, meetings have taken place with a range of key stakeholders and the Gender Advisory Panel to update and include them in the development of a new gender equality strategy. A meeting of the Gender Advisory Panel has been scheduled for early July. The current strategy will remain in place until the new strategy <laughs> is developed and that new strategy becomes operational. Uh, a new strategy will require full public consultation and executive approval. I call Mr McCann for a and I thank the junior minister for his question thus, answer thus far. Can the minister give me an update as to how transgender, transgender issues are going to be taken forward under any new gender equality strategy, given this was identified as a gap in the current strategy document? Transgender is recognised by OFM DFM as a gender issue. Transgender people uh, whose gender identity conflicts with their biological sex face lifelong challenges such as victimization, including physical and psychological abuse, and increased risk of suicide. Transgender issues were identified as a gap, as the member correctly points out, in the current strategy document, and representatives of the transgender organization joined the panel following the review of the Gender Equality Strategy in 2013. I call Mr Gregory Campbell. You, Principal Deputy Speaker, can the junior minister outline the extent of engagement that the department have had with stakeholders while outlining the gender policy, the strategy? Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, Junior Minister McCann and, and the office uh, and our staff, we have had a number of meetings and we continue to meet groups uh, organizations and individuals who have an interest in and a view to share on gender equality. Uh, so far, Junior Minister McCann and I, alongside our colleagues, uh, have recently met uh, a number of organizations. The most recent of those have been with the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland. We have met, held joint meetings with Man Matters, with Youth Action, with the Men's Action Network, and with the Men's Health Forum. We have also met with the Northern Ireland Rural Women's Network and the Northern Ireland Council for Ethnic Minorities, in addition to meeting with the Northern Ireland Women's European Platform. Mr. Loris Kelly. Deputy Speaker, the Minister outlined the necessity for a public consultation exercise but omitted to give us a definitive timescale uh, for the strategy to be published. Perhaps he could give us uh, some further indication as to that timescale and to uh, uh, highlight any other stumbling blocks that there have been in, uh, in the release of the strategy. We will work on the development uh, of a new strategy. It has begun, it started. It is based on the work that has been undertaken to date and indeed upon the current review. Um, as, as all policies have, the new strategy will require full public consultation and it will require executive approval. And we will keep the Gender Advisory Panel uh, fully engaged uh, on the progress as we make it. It is envisaged that a new gender equality strategy, allowing time for the key stages required to develop the new strategy, including the 12-week public consultation process, could be published and launched in 2014. 
The current gender equality strategy will remain in place until that new strategy is developed and operational. <coughs> the progress of, of the, the review seems to be rather slow. Uh, review happened in 2013 and there have been meetings for six months. Uh, can the Minister advise if, if there are any underlying difficulties or differences of opinion that is contributing to the, that slowness? There are no um, differences of opinion uh, uh, that I can uh, think of at all. I mean, the strategy itself, its aims, its objectives, uh, remain both relevant uh, and valid. Uh, the action plan through which the strategy is to be delivered, I think, needs to link more directly to the strategy's aims and objectives. Actions should be linked to um, measurable or numerical targets against which the action plan and progress uh, can be established. And the targets should, uh, that we're looking at and we've taken the time to look at, uh, look at where the results and achievements can be made, not just the outputs, indeed, the, i.e., the actions that are taken. The monitoring and reporting of the performance needs to be regular and it needs to be formalised. Um, the role and membership of the Gender Advisory Panel uh, continues and should be reviewed. And uh, the, any issues, as I've outlined in an earlier question, one of the issues was transgender. That was identified as a gap in the current strategy document, and that has been addressed. And I call Mr. Jerry Kelly. Good, uh, please, last John Collier, uh, Kerst Devere Tree. Question three, please. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, in October of 2012, we announced a £26 million funding package to allow for the development and delivery of six key cross-cutting delivering social change signature programmes aimed at issues such as improving literacy and numeracy levels, family support and pathways to employment for young people. Responsibility for the delivery of each of the six programmes lies with the appropriate lead department. Departments have already established in common with the other signature programmes how they and their delivery partners will evaluate the programmes to satisfy their own requirements. OFM DFM has worked collaboratively with the departments in the development of the programmes, including developing new approaches to their evaluation. Departments have agreed to include an outcomes-based approach model into their evaluations. This approach differentiates between what we wish to achieve at a strategic level and what each individual or project does achieve uh, towards their overarching goal. In addition, we are looking at a number of common metrics which can be applied across all programmes that are being delivered. These include the well-established international comparators around well-being and also given local concern around resilience and assertiveness, a pilot of two alternative metrics, locus of control and self-efficacy. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we are using these signature programmes as test beds, not only as new ways of addressing societal challenges, but also as new and more pragmatic ways of evaluating programme level impacts. Draft evaluation plans have now been received, and our officials are currently working with their counterparts in the lead departments to ensure a robust evaluation of the delivering social change signature programmes. Mr. Jerry Kelly for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer up to now and congratulate him for getting through that mouthful. I suppose the question um, that people are asking is when will we see the impact of uh, the delivery, uh, delivering social change uh, on the ground? Um, I know that you talked about drafts, uh, draft plans now being received. Well, the answer to that is that it is already being felt on the, the ground. Uh, if we aren't to use any of the more scientific approaches that uh, I have uh, outlined, uh, keeping my tongue firmly embedded between my, uh, my teeth, I think, while I, I say some of it, uh, the truth of it is most of us evaluate it by asking the people who are carrying out the programme, how is it going? And on that basis, all of the programmes are going very well. Uh, the uh, teachers that we have put uh, in place already are we are hearing from uh, the, the schools that in the uh, testing, uh, mid-term testing, that those pupils are doing better than their comparators from previous years. Uh, again, when it comes to the hubs and other uh, elements, we're getting very positive messages back. But we, we'll wait the full uh, evaluation carried out by the mechanisms that uh, officials have uh, set in place, and it will be those evaluations that will determine whether these programmes should be mainstreamed in the future.
Oh, Ms. Brenda Hale. I thank the First Minister for his very detailed answers and, and I welcome the news that the food banks are good. What plans are there for mainstreaming? Well, I think that if the reports coming back uh, continue to be uh, in the same positive vein that uh, we have uh, been receiving thus far from uh, each of the signature projects, so there's one of them operating a little slower than uh, we would like and, uh, and the others, uh, I think that it is very likely that each of the departments will want to continue with those projects. There will obviously be uh, a bidding war when it comes to setting the, the budget to ensure that they have resources that can, can meet that uh, requirement. Uh, but uh, I am very hopeful that uh, the, the steps that we have taken, uh, though it, it has to be said initially resisted by some departments because officials like to have good ideas themselves uh, rather than them coming from uh, the, the centre. Uh, but I, I think that uh, these will be successful programmes and I hope that uh, many if not all of them will be mainstreamed. I call Mr. John Dallet. Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the First Minister for his answer, and he specifically made reference to literacy and numeracy issues among children. The First Minister will be aware that illiteracy and numeracy is still running at over 20 per cent. Is the First Minister satisfied that there is sufficient funding available to address this as one of the uh, signature projects? And if it continues to be a problem, what is the plan in the long term to address at least this terrible injustice to children leaving school not able to read or write? Well, I, I agree entirely with the, the member about the, the, the scale and impact uh, of this particular uh, issue. Uh, when the Deputy First Minister and I uh, brought forward the proposals for the signature <coughs> projects, uh, they were brought forward very much on the basis of a pilot uh, so that we can test whether the improvements do come from this kind of uh, project. Uh, early indicators are, are good, but if they do, then it is a full flow of that program that will make the, the big difference. Uh, I don't see us making uh, massive changes in the, the number of uh, people uh, just because of this one program, but it will certainly signal that this is a, a way to do it that brings out uh, an outcome that is beneficial. Thank you. And I call Mr. Barry McElduff. <coughs> Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. We have uh, regularly stated our commitment to producing a sexual orientation strategy in the Assembly. Uh, we did it in the text of the Good Relations Strategy and in together building a united community. To achieve this commitment, we asked officials to commence a public consultation process. The first phase of that process ended on the 6th of June. Responses to this 12-week consultation period are currently being analysed, and the results will be used to inform the content of a draft sexual orientation strategy. The strategy will then be referred to the Executive for final agreement and publication in a draft format. A second phase of public consultation will then take place. Michael Duff, do you ask a supplementary? Thank the junior Minister for his answer. And can I just ask the Junior Minister to outline perhaps the timeline for taking forward the various stages of consultation that he mentioned? Can I thank the member uh, for his question? Um, it's held uh, the process itself is being held over uh, two phases. Phase one commenced with the establishment of a project group. The project group held its first meeting in February 2014. The results of phase one will help to uh, inform the development uh, of the sexual orientation strategy. Phase two will then involve the development of the draft strategy, including public consultation, full public consultation. Uh, on the final agreed draft. Now, within that, we have membership uh, of the project group, including our own officials, stakeholders, academia, trade union representation, our research branch officials in OFM, DFM, uh, and they're all participating in the project group. It's chaired within our own Equality and Human Rights Directorate, and the group has held a number of meetings, and the next one will take place following 
the analysis of phase one consultation exercise. Uh, the consultation was launched via a press advertisement on the 14th of March 2014 and closed after the 12-week consultation process on the 6th of June. The consultation document has been made available in hard copy and online, and our research branch has developed an online survey questionnaire to accompany the document, and this was used as the primary basis for consultation. And the public were asked uh, to complete in a number of ways, including the questionnaire on the website, which was developed in conjunction with research branch and project group. They could complete a hard copy uh, or by telephone link with a dedicated telephone line for that subject. Uh, they could submit responses in writing via post or by email. Uh, and then as I say, when that, we go to phase two, we look at the results uh, of phase one, and that analysis will then inform the development of the strategy. I call Mr. Michael Copeland. Thank you very much, yep. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I thank the, the junior minister. Um, uh, could he confirm that, to the best of my recollection, he told the House, and this will be published in 2012, and does he accept my cynicism that this, this could be indicative of a difficulty in agreeing the strategy? It's always an, an interesting to uh, comment on another member's cynicism. Um, any question I give is the best answer I can give uh, at the particular time uh, of giving it. Uh, we have worked uh, very hard on it. Uh, I think phase one has shown the work that we have done. I do commend our officials uh, and the groups that have cooperated with us and we have met and discussed and gone through what are very complex uh, matters. Um, we have now phase one through and I think you will see uh, phase two with the analysis and the development of the strategy. The project group put in place to manage and oversee the consultation process, that's going to continue to have oversight of the development of the strategy and of its action plan. And the draft strategy, when it's developed, and yes, it has to be agreed, will be referred to the executive for the final agreement and publication in draft format with a view then to implementing a further public consultation process. Go, Mr. Jim Allister. Why were so many of the questions lacking in objectivity and presented in a wholly loaded fashion? I think the questions that were developed, and it's an area of sensitivity and complexity, uh, the questions were developed uh, in conjunction with uh, what uh, sectors, needs and groups were talking to us and informing and consulting us upon. I think on the basis of the questions that were put together, it gives us the basis to move towards uh, phase two and to see where we can have agreement and to bring it forward to the executive following full public consultation for agreement. Thank you. And I call Ms. Karen McEvitt. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, question six. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. I thank the member for her question. The Bright Start School Aids Child Care Grant Scheme was developed to take forward three of the Bright Start key first actions. The scheme was launched on the 27th of March 2014, and it has to date attracted 76 full applications and 60 expressions of interest. The Child Care Partnerships are currently assessing applications. Assessment will finish on the 25th of June, uh, and the first letters of offer should issue before September. The Bright Start School Aids Child Care Grant Scheme is aiming to create or to sustain up to 7,000 school aids child care places by assisting current and prospective child care providers. These envisaged child care places will begin to address the need for additional school aids child care services. The grant scheme will assist childcare settings serving disadvantaged and rural communities and settings that are based on the school estate. Supplementary. Thanks. Uh, could the Minister confirm uh, if the Bright Start scheme will be made available to the private childcare minders? Well, the, the scheme, uh, as, as we have put out and we have said right from the very beginning, was never intended uh, it was to displace where there was uh, existing uh, provision. Now, we have we've, we've published uh, what we are doing. 
um, and we have, we have sought to find a gap where the gaps existed, because we had to follow where the evidence was leading us, and we knew particularly that not the three uh, age group was, I wouldn't say overly well provided for, but it was provided for in comparison to school age, where in some cases, some of the research was indicating that it could be up to one in 19 chance to get an actual place. So we never sought to displace where the uh, private uh, sector has. I have uh, visited uh, and taken part in a number uh, of projects that they have and taken part in their standards awards for the private sector. Um, but the reason that we targeted the group within Bright Start was this. What families were telling us, what particularly young mothers were telling us, was that there was a gap. The gap was in school age, and the need was for flexibility, and the need was for affordability. And that's why we took the social enterprise model, that we could target particularly to meet the needs where they were identified. But I'm quite happy to meet, as I have been doing with the private sector, and share with them uh, the project and what we're doing and the reasons why we're doing it. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of the, uh, the period for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And the minister listed at number one has withdrawn his name. I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. In relation to the institutional abuse inquiry, there has been a call for an interim report from the inquiry as a compassionate response to victims and survivors. Could I ask the Minister uh, if this has been raised with the Chair of the inquiry? And do, does uh, OFM, DFM have any firm views for an inquiry uh, on the needs of non-institutional victims of clerical abuse? Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, we, of course, gave a, a remit to uh, a learned uh, judge uh, who is completely independent in terms of the uh, inquiry that he is carrying out. Uh, he has spoken with, the, uh, with my colleagues, I, I think the, the junior ministers, yep. uh, fairly recently. Uh, he does not feel it would be helpful to have an interim uh, report. Uh, I think one can understand that uh, all of his motivation is to, to get to the, the finish line at the, uh, the, the quickest possible time period without uh, prejudicing in any way the, uh, the depth of the inquiry that he, he carries out. Uh, and I, I think we have to take his advice on that, considering that uh, independently he is carrying it out. Uh, the uh, clerical abuse issue is to be considered uh, after we receive a, a report uh, from uh, the, the judge in relation to, to this inquiry. Uh, we, of course, always hear not just in terms of clerical abuse, but there are other areas where clearly uh, the Magdalene Laundries would be another e example where there, there is, if you like, unfinished business and uh, there is a level of trauma uh, with those who have been uh, involved. We are very sensitive and uh, sympathetic uh, to all of those who have been uh, involved, but we do need to, to carry out our own research to determine whether it is appropriate for government intervention on those uh, issues. Uh, so we will consider them more fully, I think, uh, after the HIA report is received. Call Mr. Bradley for supplementary. Thank the Minister, First Minister, for his answer. But does he not uh, agree with me that the, the needs of the victims of non-institutional uh, clerical abuse, that they too need to be recognised and that they also deserve uh, the matter to be fully looked into? Yes. Uh, of course, they, they do need uh, support, and of course, there is uh, support through the various agencies uh, of government for those who have been involved in the horrendous activities that uh, both he and I and uh, this House will be uh, aware of. Uh, as to whether there should be a, an inquiry uh, into them, that is a, a matter that uh, has a slightly higher threshold in terms of the number of incidences that there are, whether it merits an inquiry in terms of the, the size of the inquiry that would be necessary or whether it is simply individual investigations within the, uh, the various institutions uh, involved. Those are the kind of issues that we will look at when we see the, the depth uh, of the HIA report. Thank you. And I call Mr. Cahill Boylan. 
Could I ask the Minister, can he confirm whether or not he and his party are up for serious um, and intensive negotiations to implement the Haas proposals in the coming days? Well, I am sure that the, the member did not intend to indicate that his party was not up for negotiations on the outstanding issues, but by saying that uh, it was simply the implementation of the Haas proposals. Uh, that is precisely what he is saying. Uh, I can assure you that this party is serious about dealing with the three outstanding issues, the issues of uh, parades, flags, identity uh, and, uh, uh, of course, the past. Uh, those are important issues which, uh, whether we resolve them this month, next or in a year's time, have to be resolved, but they will not be resolved on the basis of people digging in their heels to one set of uh, outcomes that suits them. It has to be a set of outcomes that suits all of the parties uh, in this House. Uh, otherwise, it is not simply going to, to, to happen. So I, I hope that uh, all of the parties who engage in these discussions will do so on the basis of getting outcomes that can get widespread support across the, the parties and with the community. Mr. Boylan, for supplementary. Could I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. But could the, would the Minister not agree that these issues need to be dealt with urgently and resolved urgently? I, I agree totally with the, the member that uh, there is a, an urgency with these matters. Uh, it would have been great if uh, the five parties involved in the discussions last year had been able to, to reach uh, agreement. That was not uh, possible. Uh, I'm not sure that raking over the embers gets us very much further. There has been progress, in my view, since then. The party leaders' meetings have uh, disaggregated uh, the Haas proposals uh, and started looking at which of those uh, sets of uh, proposals, because I, I think literally there were hundreds of individual agreements contained within the, the overall Haas document. We started to look at what elements of that uh, document there was not uh, overall agreement, and I, I think we have reduced the number where there was not uh, agreement back in, uh, at the end of last uh, year. Uh, however, there are still some issues that have not been uh, resolved. Uh, we have attempted to change our, uh, uh, our method of operating somewhat in that we are bringing in a secretariat so that uh, rather than us sitting around the table and trying to uh, take minutes and resolve issues at the same time. We can have uh, suggestions put to us by uh, officials, and I think all of the parties, uh, when they meet uh, later on this week, uh, I hope will agree that uh, that is uh, the right way forward. We produced a paper uh, that was circulated to all of the party leaders. Uh, I haven't heard uh, anybody indicating that they are unhappy with that way forward, uh, and hopefully all of the parties will sit down seriously and expeditiously to deal with those matters. And I call Mr. Peter Weir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Can I ask the uh, First Minister to update us on what the present position is as regards welfare reform in Northern Ireland and uh, also whether there has been any further discussions with the UK Government on the subject? Well, the, uh, the Executive last considered this uh, matter on the, the basis of uh, two proposals. One was that the executive would meet to deal with that issue on its own uh, so that it would not uh, lose its focus with other executive business. And the second was that uh, rather than us bandy around uh, figures and potential problems that may arise either by accepting welfare reform on the revised basis put forward by the DSD minister uh, or otherwise, uh, because there are two sets of, at least two sets of figures uh, out there as to what the likely cost is. There are all sorts of questions about uh, whether we could undertake the payments through computerisation uh, and what the delay might be as well as the, the cost of, of that. Uh, and the suggestion was that we uh, task uh, some uh, consultant to look at those specific issues so that we would have a, a common reference point so that nobody is arguing, no, it's not 400 million, it's something else. Uh, and I think it's essential that we get to that, uh, that stage. When we have that, Everybody in the executive will have all of the information they need to take the decision, knowing what uh, the outcome will, will be if they go for uh, the revised package on welfare reform, and equally 
they will be aware of what the consequences are if they don't. Call Mr. Peter Weir for supplement. Uh, thank, I thank the First Minister for his answer. Uh, the First Minister spoke of consequences, and could the First Minister outline whether he has any expectations of any shift in position uh, on the issue of the Westminster Government, and if not, what the financial consequences for areas such as health and education would be? I apologise to the member. He had a, a second leg to his first question uh, in terms of uh, the United Kingdom government's uh, position. Uh, I've spoken on a number of occasions uh, to the Secretary of State on the issue. She's made it absolutely clear to me that uh, as far as DWP is concerned, they have uh, finished their negotiations on the issue. There will be no further concession from Her Majesty's Government uh, on the, the matter. Uh, and that was again stressed uh, when the Deputy First Minister and I met with Nick Clegg uh, in the uh, fringes of the Guernsey British Irish uh, Summit meeting, uh, making it very clear that uh, you know, anything else we do on welfare reform, we need to do ourselves. So if the package is to improve, it will improve because we decide to do something in addition to what is in the proposal uh, set by uh, Nelson McCausland. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, we are happy to, to talk about those issues, how the uh, programme can be put out uh, in a form that makes it more acceptable, because don't forget, within the package that Nelson McCausland brought forward, there was a multi-million pound uh, a contingency fund being set up to deal with the hardship cases. Uh, so you know, we, we can work on that to be more specific about how it would be used uh, and, and to Look at, uh, for instance, I was at uh, the opening or at the report stage of the uh, East Belfast Independent Advice Centre last Friday. Uh, they have indicated the vast increase in work that they have had because of uh, debt and welfare uh, issues. There may well be a requirement for us as part of that package to be doing something to uh, resource advice centres better to deal with these uh, issues. And I know from my, my own uh, advice centre that uh, the number of people coming in with heavy envelopes and bin bags full of uh, bills, some un unopened, indicate that there are re very real difficulties uh, in terms of, of debt uh, and, and welfare that we need to get addressed. Mr. William Humphrey. Uh, thank the First Minister for his uh, answer so far. Building on the very uh, dignified Apprentice Boys Parade at Easter down Donegal Street, would the First Minister agree that Friday night's tour of the North Parade in my constituency in North Belfast was a very dignified and disciplined parade? I congratulate the Orange Institution for that, and does he agree with me that it has set this tone for a very peaceful parading season for this year? Well, I certainly join with the, the member uh, in congratulating all of those who have been involved uh, in uh, expressing their culture uh, in a way that isn't offensive to anyone else, uh, which has gone off lawfully and peacefully. Uh, and that's the process that I want to see uh, continue. Uh, I hope it is a harbinger of uh, things to, to come. Uh, this province uh, is set back when there is uh, violence and disorder uh, on the streets. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, not only, and this is where the, the, the central issue has to be about tolerance and respect. Tolerance of the parades and respect by those on parades. Those have to be the, the central features of a good summer for us. Mr. Humphrey, for a supplementary. First Minister, for his answer. The First Minister, like me, has been at meetings recently with the Parades Commission. Given that the former Parades Commission uh, rewarded violence with its determination last year for the 12th of July evening at Ardoin for the Ligony Lodges returning, does the First Minister agree with me that the current and new Commission is in danger of being seen by the public in Northern Ireland as being? Uh, intimidated by the threat of violence from dissident Republicans? Well, the, the issue isn't uh, new. Uh, there is uh, certainly a feeling within the uh, loyalist and unionist community that uh, those who uh, wag the largest stick are the ones that get heard. Uh, and that is not the way uh, for us to go in government or in any institutions uh, of government. As soon as you start rewarding people either for violence or the threat of violence, you encourage more violence and more threats. Uh, and uh, maybe not just from those who have issued them in the first place, because if you teach people the, the message that violence works, 
then they'll say, well, the only way we're going to get our parade down the road uh, is to have greater violence. And that is not a message that uh, any politician uh, would want to uh, endorse. So let's be very clear, the Parades Commission uh, should be taking decisions and there should always be a presumption in favour of a, a parade. And there must always be, uh, in my view, uh, attempts made to resolve those, those outstanding issues. But if they are uh, going to be resolved, they must be resolved on a basis that nobody thinks that the default position is automatically going to be that there is going to be no parade. And I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Margaret, can I ask the Minister uh, to provide assurance of the Executive's ongoing commitment to the A5 dual carriageway project? Well, Mr. Pre uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, this is an Executive decision. Uh, the Executive uh, agreed to this project. We have uh, had several setbacks. First of all, when the uh, Government of the Republic of Ireland decided that uh, because of their economic difficulties they couldn't keep the commitment that they had given. Uh, but instead uh, reduced that uh, commitment. With the reduced commitment, we went forward uh, and the, the courts knocked us back uh, on the basis of uh, work uh, being required uh, in some of the environmental uh, areas. Uh, that, none of that reduces uh, our commitment uh, to the, the scheme. Uh, obviously, we await uh, from the DRD minister uh, information that leads us uh, to expect uh, another application to, to go in. I hope that it goes in in a form that it can, be, uh, it can withstand any challenge in the, the courts, uh, and uh, then the, the next small task would be that of the finance ministers to, to, to find us uh, the, the appropriate amount of money to carry out the scheme. Order, and that uh, ends the, uh, the time for topical questions. Thank you, Minister.